Um, I don't know if you're familiar with any of these. Um, <clears throat> and there are maybe hundreds that do the same thing. Um, Edgy Creations and Vittel uh, convert your tablet into a, a digital whiteboard and record your voice. So you can write on the board, you can pause and add images and put things from the internet and so on. It makes it very, very easy to create instructional videos with your voice using your tablet. Uh, I've seen lots of maths teachers use this, now explaining how they solve maths problems and, and things like this, right? So this is a, is a great, again, wasn't designed for education, but we as teachers think about ways that we can um, adapt things for education. Padlet we saw before. Um, Edmodo is like Facebook, but it's, you're probably aware of this now, but it's designed for education. So again, it's a safe kind of educational version of, uh, of Facebook. And, and Jing is my absolute favorite, okay? Because it's the quickest. Uh, uh, haven't you seen it before? It's the quickest and it's the easiest and it's absolutely great. So let's have a, let's have a quick look at this. Basically, what I can do is click on here, select an area of the screen, press record. So this is the questionnaire that we did today, and here we have the answers to the different questions. So uh, in the first one, it seems that the most popular answer was number two, in the second one the most popular answer was number one, in the third one number one, in the fourth one number four, in the fifth one number three, and in the final one number four. Okay, now, finish, and Okay, now, if I want to share this video, the video doesn't exist physically, really. It's in the cloud. So, okay, we're on quite slow Wi-Fi here. But this bar would normally go up quite quickly. <clears throat> and when it gets to the top, in your right click, you have the link to the video. You can send the video, post the vi uh, send the link, or uh, via email, or, or put the link on your school website, or send it via Padlet, or whatever you want to do. And then whoever clicks on there will see this video. Um, and it has so many possible functions. It takes the teaching outside of the classroom. You can make free videos of up to five minutes. Um, you can get your students to use this as well. I had um, I, I taught a group of university teachers a few years ago, teaching them English. And I used this to give them feedback on their written work. Because giving written feedback, but I can give spoken feedback in two minutes with their work on the screen, which is much more detailed than, the, than I would be willing to write. Um, and I did this with this group of students. And one of the students was a, a teacher of nursing, and his eyes lit up, and he said, great, I can use this with my students, because one of the tasks that he wanted them to do 
was to interpret uh, x-ray images no? of chests, broken bones, and things like this. And he said that uh, what he was going to do with them was send them the images of the x-rays, and what they'd have to do on their computer is put this on the screen and create the little video with the commentary and so on, send it back to him, and this was part of their assessment, no? part of their evaluation. So really, when you think that you can make a quick and simple video which occupies no space on your computer just by selecting the screen and adding your voice, then I think this becomes a very powerful tool. It's a, a screen casting tool, right? Um, it's better if you have good Wi-Fi. Yeah? So, for example, Okay, you can't hear this very well, but this is uh, a portfolio of activities from one of my students. And what I did in advance was highlighted some things that were interesting. Then I created the video, uh, sent the video back to her. You can see me in a moment scrolling through her work, making some comments. I can even work on the document in real time and highlight things and so on. So um, it's a great way for giving input but also a fantastic way for giving, uh, for giving feedback. Now, and we're going to cancel this because it wasn't the most interesting of videos anyway. And I'm not sure if you're aware of these. When I, was revising, when I was revising this presentation yesterday, I had a big disappointment. I don't know if you know about Present Me, but Present Me is an online tool which allows you to upload a PowerPoint presentation and to add your voice, and if you want or not, to also add your webcam image. So it's great for giving presentations and for giving input. And when I was checking this yesterday and checking the link, it said, sorry, we are disappearing. Um, however, however, on the, on the message it said, we advise you to check out Office Mix. And Office Mix is something that I'd already started using anyway. Uh, are any of you aware of it? <clears throat> it's a free plugin for PowerPoint. If you have a if you have a pirated version, then sorry. If you have an original version that you've paid for and a license and so on, you can get this free plugin, and it's a video suite which allows you to record videos of your PowerPoint presentations. And you can pause, you can, you can actually draw on the presentations and highlight them and so on, and it records this on the video but doesn't record it on the original presentation. Or, or if you want it to, you can so that you have two versions. And it means that you can make um, videos of your, of your presentations. Um, like I said, it's free. It's an excellent tool. I'm going to show you, see if we get lucky. So this is, um, I, I teach um, blended learning semi-presencial courses as well. Uh, and I see my students three times, three Saturdays. Uh, and everything else is online. And I teach the same subject that I teach presencial. And sometimes it's very, like it's a bit of a shame for me that I don't get to see them so much. So some of the classes that I give, if I have the presentation made, I create a video using present me before and now using Office Mix. And what it means is that they can't escape from me. They even have to watch me at home. Volume's not very good in here.
So what they get essentially is a class. They kind of don't really need to come to class. They get the activities sent to them. They do, when they do come to class, this is the thing. I have three Saturdays with a group per subject, and I get an hour and 50 minutes with them, so a little bit less than this session today. Now, I don't really know these students. Um, I might have 25 in a group, and I meet them three times. Um, attendance is not mandatory. They can decide to come to the class or not which puts me in a very difficult uh, situation, or all of the teachers really, because we are not allowed to do anything which is essential for the subject, because assistance, uh, sorry, attendance is not obligatory. But we have to do something useful and interesting for them to try and motivate them to come. It's pretty tricky, right? This is why this flipped model is particularly good in this case, because they get all of the input outside class and what I do inside the classroom is resolve doubts, extend them, discuss these things, etc, etc, and all the work they've done in preparation for, for the class. <clears throat> what are the challenges of this? Well, it means that I go into class. I have some things prepared, but I don't really know what's going to happen. No? Uh, and it also means that I definitely can't have everybody doing the same thing at the same time. Because maybe these three over here, maybe these three just really didn't understand any of my explanation whatsoever. So I have to, and the others, they did, and they're interested in something else, so I have to try and find some way to extend them. However, although this feels like a lot of work, if you have a control and a command of the subject, it's much more, more fulfilling, much more enjoyable, because you really think that you're responding to their needs and everybody gets to the same place in the end, but it's not the lockstep marching approach, right? It's everybody kind of going at their, at their own rhythm. So the other thing is time. Teachers always complain about time. We never have enough time. However, if we see this as an investment, then it changes its net. Because some of these videos... I made five years ago. Haven't taught that class since. I send them to the video, and we do different things in class. So, um, you know, contents, the law changes. Contents, cha like what used to be unit three is now unit five, but the, cha the contents don't change that much. No? So producing these things, I think, is a, is a very worthwhile, a very worthwhile investment. So, some of the ideas, some of the things that we can do with these tools. A lot of the stuff that we do anyway, but often takes up a lot of time. Another situation I come across quite often is teachers saying they don't have enough time in class have to finish the book, don't have enough time. But I observe a lot of teachers teaching, and I see a lot of valuable time wasted doing things that, for example, correcting homework. No? Correcting homework. I gave you 10 questions for homework. Okay? So, Jaime, question number one. Come to the front. Write the answer on the board. No? Jaime, thank you very much. Good. Sit down. Maria, question number two. Come and, and we get 50 minutes of correcting 10 questions for which were homework, right? Um, by using these tools, we can give them the answers. I, I'm always in favor of projecting the answers, giving them the answers, and if they got any wrong, they tell you. And it turns out that everybody got number eight wrong. So what do we spend time on? Question number eight. No, we don't spend time on question number one, two, three, four, and five. And six and seven that everybody got correct. No? Um, so I think it is the, the, one of the big messages from, the, from today, I hope, is about, um, is about maximizing time, no? optimizing the time.
Um, another big idea. Um, pro. Pro is a very nice word. Pro is a very positive thing. No? Consumers. Um, yeah, the internet used to be about consuming content, no? but then we got Web 2.0, and it's about producing content as well. The thing is, with all of these tools that we can use for ourselves, these screen casting tools, Office Mix, Jing, things like this, is that if we get our students to use them as well. Um, and some of these, I mean, they can use them not only for just producing these things, but for collaborating as well. Today's Meet, Padlet, um, the Google Docs and things like this, these are all things that we can get the students to use and they can collaborate and cooperate in, in real time, right? <clears throat> Um, couple more things, and then I'm gonna <clears throat> I'm gonna get past the the section of me showing you some tools. The thing is with the tools, though, is that these are just examples, and there are many other tools that can do the same thing. Teachers sometimes say to me things like, "Matthew, how can I use Twitter in class? I want to use Twitter," and I say, "Why?" Silence. The the technology is not the objective. I asked them, wait a minute, what's the activity? What do you want to do? Because maybe Twitter's not the best thing for doing it. Maybe there's something else that could accomplish the same objective. And teachers sometimes think that, or people sometimes think that the, the technology itself is the, is the objective, and it certainly isn't. Have any of you ever used a wiki? Let's see if I can open this one. Okay, so I had a had a wiki with a group of uh, with a group of students. I've done this several times. Wiki is really easy. Wiki is a is a, a website that you can edit. So on any of these pages, if you click on edit, it transforms to something like a word document. So you can add images, you can write, you can do whatever. And when you click save, it transforms back into a, a web page again. Now, one of the things I, I did here is this, this was a group of students. Uh, yeah, this is step, and, and we did a, a little psychological test. I went into class and I said, "Okay, draw a tree. Everybody, take a piece of paper and draw a tree." Do you know the tree test? It's quite common psychological test, right? So they, they didn't know what I was doing this for. So I said, "Draw a tree." So everybody drew a tree. I said, "Okay, show, show your trees." Some of them were very artistic. Some of them not quite so much. And I said, "Okay, the tree." says a lot about your personality. Your homework is to go home, get on the internet, and discover what your tree says about you. Then what you have to do is upload your picture. Take a photo or scan, upload it onto the, onto the wiki, and I'd like you to write underneath what you've discovered about your psychological profile and what the tree says about you. So this is kind of student-generated content. Like, I didn't explain this to them. I gave them the medium, and, and we had some really interesting ones. Look at this one. It's very nice. See? Bea here, she has, she has some apples in her tree, and she has some roots in her tree, which says a lot about her. This tree has no ground. It's just suspended in midair. This says something about her as well. All of these trees. I think some of the trees say something about their artistic capabilities as well. This would be my limit of drawing a tree, I think, this one. And my favorite one. This is my favorite tree. Clearly, he is obsessed with something. So, um, the wiki is a great thing, but it could be a blog. There are other things that you could use as well, but it's editable content generated by your students, and it's a great way of communicating with them. Uh,
Another strong reason for doing this. Do you know what the 21st, what the 21st century skills are? Well, first of all, do you know what the four C's of CLIL are? And I really hope you know this by now. They are... In any particular order, content, cognition, communication, and culture, right? Now, curiously, 21st century skills have also been divided into a framework of four C's. Do you know what they are? Let's have a look. Very clever. It's easy when you know the answer. <laughs> and the thing is that these kind of coincide with CLIL. Anyway, communication is a big one, of course. Um, creativity and critical thinking, really, these are elements, high elements of cognition. Uh, and collaboration, well, you know, this is slightly different maybe, no? but, um, but the, you can see the similarities here. Do you know about Bloom's taxonomy? You've had this, right? So this is what I showed you before. Um, this was the, the SAMA model. And the higher up we go, the easier it is to justify the use of the technology. And I think this matches quite nicely with Bloom's taxonomy as well. So the higher we go, when you start re redefining tasks, they tend to be more evaluative and more creative. Um, so there's a strong imperative here for incorporating technology into our lessons when it's at a level of modifying and redefining and when it involves analyzing, evaluating, and creating rather than the lower order thinking skills. Now, I want to do a little, I want to do a little test with you because I'm just curious. Because I said, do you know about Bloom's taxonomy? And people go, yeah. Do you know about cognition? Yeah. So, here's a little test for you. Uh, do you remember the levels at the bottom? Ah, not, no, the pyramids, not the other one. Uh, Bloom's taxonomy. Remembering. You might want to write them down, maybe. Remembering, understanding, applying, these are lots. Analyzing, evaluating, creating, these are hots. Now, what I'd like you to do very quickly with your partners is, I've got five questions here, and I want you to decide with your partners on which level each of these questions might be working. Good luck. So, oh, I could, I could correct the answers and get one person to come to the front and do number one and another person, but that would be, that would, we haven't got that much time, so, there you go. Now I'm sure, because this is not the first time I've done this. I'm sure that some of you thought some of those questions were much higher order than they really are. 
Like, for example, the first one. Can you give me an example? I don't know why. Teachers think this is a high, tend to think this is a higher order thinking question. But really, it's just understanding. Let give me give you a little, uh, a little example. Can you give me an example of an amphibian? Okay, see? Now, if you can give me an example, I know you understand the concept of amphibian, right? Good. Now, can you give me 10 examples of an amphibian? Is that harder? Is that higher level thinking? No, 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 no. Absolutely not. What I just did is I made low level thinking more difficult, but I didn't make it high level thinking. Because if you give me one example, that's easy, because we all know a frog. But if I ask for five or ten, cognitively, we're working at exactly the same level. I just changed the conditions and made low-level thinking harder. Can you give me a definition of an amphibian? Anyone feeling brave? Definition of an amphibian. Last time I did this, there were some secondary school teachers, and I had a biology teacher. Her, her, her explanation just... Blew me away, really. Um, can you give me a definition of an amphibian? Okay, so it's an animal that can breathe under the water and also on land, right? Very good. What level of thinking is that? Could be remembering if you read that definition and committed it to memory, or it could be understanding. But do you notice what happens here? It's on the same level as can you give me an example? How did I make it more difficult? I made it linguistically more challenging. Because giving a definition is more difficult. And also, we need relative clauses. It's an animal which can lit, that's a relative clause, quite complex language. But the level of thinking is very low. Linguistically, it's more difficult than saying frog. But cognitively, it's no more difficult, really. <clears throat> now, really high-level thinking would be, how would you test if an animal is an amphibian? Silence. Nobody's saying frog here. It's a rhetorical question. It, it is a rhetorical question, yeah. How would you now, if I asked you this question, how would you and you had to design a test to discover if an animal is an amphibian or not, if you could do that, then you'd really understand amphibians at a much higher or deeper level, depending on how we're thinking about it, right? Now, one thing you could do is you could hold it underwater uh, for three minutes. And when you bring it up, if it's alive, it's an amphibian. If it's not, it wasn't. Cat, amphibian or not? Huh? Could be, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Um, the thing is, is when we move to a more flipped model, the lower level thinking stuff, which is the understanding and the remembering, can be done with these screen casting tools or the reading that you ask them to do or the things that you ask them to do outside class. And all of the stuff which challenges them and extends them, because you've laid the foundation outside the class, can be done inside the class. Now, I know some of you will be thinking, yeah, but what if they don't do it at home? Okay. Not ideal, but also not a problem that we cannot overcome. Some students come to class having done and understood everything we asked of them. Some of them come to class having done kind of understood. Some of them come to class having done and understood nothing, and some of them come to class not having done. But therefore, we can change the grouping, we can change the activities, and we can do the things which respond more to their, to their needs, right? So this is very, um, this is very connected to um, a justification for flip learning. Now, <clears throat> what I was going to get you to do but we're running out of time, is uh, to create a Google form. Now, the Google form is what we did before with the questionnaire about digital technology. 
Have any of you ever created one or used one? For those of you who haven't, I'll just show you very, very briefly, because I think it's a great thing. So I'm in my Google Drive here. Google Drive, of course, is free. The other thing is, this is not the only tool for doing this. You have Quizlet, you have lots of other tools that you can do for creating this kind of thing. But if I go on New, and then I go down to More, and then I go down to Google, it's okay, it's gonna last 12, 12%, 12 got loads of time. So New, More, Google Forms, And here I can create different types of questions. They can be multiple choice. They can be on a scale like the one that I asked you to do. You can ask them to write short answers. They can be yes or no, etc., etc. And again, when you want to share this, you send it and it arrives uh, as a link to whoever you send it to. Now, it's a great thing for teachers to use but it's an amazing thing to get students to use as well. There's something very powerful about students assessing other students. Let's take a topic, for example, I don't know, photosynthesis, for example. And imagine I have, this is my class, and I have this group over here, and I ask them to create a Google Forms exam, test, questionnaire, whatever you want to call it, to create it and to send the link to them. And then I ask them to create one with 10 questions and to send the link to them and so on successively. No? And then finally what we get is a load of student created exams. Now, the students criteria for creating those exams, what are they gonna do? First of all, they're gonna think what's important What's necessary? What was difficult for me? What do I know about this? What am I going to ask the other people? Okay? And also, they're probably going to want to make their exam difficult. Okay? And what will happen here is that not everybody will get all of the questions correct, but that doesn't matter. This is formative assessment. This is the teacher identifying what the students know and don't know, what they think is important, what they don't think is important, and so on. And it's student generated content. Now that's one idea of one use for this technology. And again, it's taking learning a little bit outside the classroom and changing what we do. Because imagine the homework is you're going to receive a little test, a little questionnaire from your classmate. I want you to answer it. And in the next class, we're going to go through the answers. You saw what I did with the graph. You could see what the responses were. You could see you have a wealth of information here, and this is really flipping the classroom on its head because what you're doing in class is guiding, correcting, extending all of these things, right? So, and now I'm going to finish. You were a bit late coming back, so you do kind of owe me 10 minutes. Just saying. So, this is uh, kind of to, to summarize. By flipping the classroom and doing this kind of thing and using these kind of tools, if we do it well, we're doing this. Another big idea was this one, that content doesn't have to come from the teacher necessarily. No, it doesn't have to be uh, teacher generated or chosen by the teacher. No, it can come from the students as well. And this very much modifies the role of the teacher in the classroom, I think. And finally, and I'm going to be a little bit cheeky here. Thank you very much. 
<laughs> this book uh, would be a welcome addition to your school, I think. It's called Planning for Clil. It's in Spanish, even though the title's in English. Uh, there's a, a, a whole kind of theoretical framework and background on how to do CLIL, the things to take into consideration and how to do it. Uh, there are also some uh, sections in there which are in English, which are reflection tasks or tasks that you might be able to do with your colleagues, with yourself, to reflect on how you're, how you're teaching and how you're applying CLIL or how you're trying to apply CLIL in your, in your classrooms. And at the end of the book, the final unit is a didactic unit, which is in English as well. And it puts into practice all of these principles and all of these ideas that are explained in the rest of the book. It's about 110 pages. It's only a, a thin thing, no? Um, so I think it's something that you might be interested in. Don't worry. I'm not going to... Somebody's going to... Somebody might make some money out of this, but it won't be me. Um, so it's, I, I really believe in it. I think it would be nice, uh, it'd be a nice addition to your school's library, perhaps, and it could be very helpful for you. I uh, hope you enjoyed the session. You've been very nice. You've been very participative. And uh, I hope I've convinced you of the idea that we can partially flip the classroom. Of course, any methodology, if taken to its extreme, becomes a bit ridiculous. But there are elements here which hopefully you can incorporate, which will mean that you do in class stuff which is more personalized for your group of students and stuff that you enjoy doing a bit more and that they enjoy doing a bit more. Uh, and, and, you know, this can be a very productive experience. So uh, I hope... Some of this was convincing because I believe it. Thank you.